Have you ever felt like you were reading something and when you weren't paying attention or when you weren't looking, it took on a life of its own, almost started to turn into something else, maybe even started to worm its way inside you. Today we're talking about Uzumaki. Okay, so as usual, like with all these videos, I'm gonna do my best to recount exactly what I was feeling at the time of reading the story as I was reading the story. And as usual, that's gonna come with some complaints. But after finishing the story and looking back on it, I don't necessarily know how to feel about some of those complaints in hindsight. But I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna recount them as I experienced them as I usually would anyway. But just kind of hang in there if you disagree or you're rolling your eyes because as the story goes, I'm going to recontextualize some of those towards the end. But with all that being said, we should probably get started. But really quick, before we do anything else, I want to give an extra special shout out to my newest patron, Grey Malk. And a thank you in general to all of my patrons. Thank you guys so very much for supporting me here in this channel. I really do appreciate it. Anyway, let's get started. Meet Kiri Gosham. She's our main character and the lens through which we're going to see this whole world through. We start the story with her on her way to the train station to meet her boyfriend. When she runs into her boyfriend's dad, who's crouched down in the middle of an alley staring at a snail in the wall. And I want to stop right here for just a second to talk about the art. It's special and unique in a certain way for some reason. First off, it's beautiful but it also feels extremely stripped down. Almost plain, and I would venture to say even maybe old-fashioned in a way. There is a very distinct feel to it. I think it's a very cozy feel to the art, and I think that's intentional. So anyway, when she meets her boyfriend at the train station, she's going to mention to him that she saw his dad acting strange on her way to meet him. And Suichi says, yeah, he's been acting real strange lately. And then he pretty much proceeds to ask her just to leave town with him, just to get the hell out, because there's something wrong with this place, and he can feel it. To which she says, I don't feel anything strange. And he says, yeah, but that's because you live here, and you stay here all the time. I go to school in another town, and I know what it's like outside of here, and then I come back, and this place isn't right. Anyway, back at Kiri's house... Suichi's dad is there talking to her dad and he's just rambling like a madman about spirals and obsessing over spirals and the glorious spirals and talking to Kiri's dad about how he's a potter making these and the shapes that are being formed by it as he goes, really putting on display that this man has developed an obsession with spirals to the point where we get a shot of him spinning his bathwater just to watch it spin. Suichi tries to explain to Kiri just how bad things have gotten, and Kiri just doesn't get it. So he invites her over to his house to see just how bad things are getting. And on the way there, we see like little whirlwinds and stuff like that going down the road. And I only bring this up because Junji draws literally no attention to them. As they go by, you're just walking, you just get a little whirlwind, and you think, oh, yeah, oh I get it, it's a spiral. Those little harmless images that you see at this point are going to mean so much more later on in the story. And the fact that they're there and he doesn't bother to draw attention to them is just late. There's layers here as you go that you don't know you're seeing until way later. Anyway, when we get to the house, his dad's going completely ballistic because his mom has thrown away his spiral collection. And at this point, we get to see the first real glimpses of the other side of Junji's art. If the first side is plain and old-fashioned and cozy feeling. This is not like with the images of him rolling his eyes or especially when she comes back to the house looking for Suichi and he's not there and she finds his dad attempting to call the spiral from within himself. And I guess all I can say is that the art style feels like the same art. But that plainness has been replaced by a layer of almost meticulous detail and an overwhelming feeling of a perversion of that coziness. 
which is why I feel like this is so intentional and which makes it that much more upsetting. There's, there's like disturbing imagery that's disturbing from the ground up. This isn't that. This is disturbing, but it still maintains part of that cutesy, comfy, cozy, old-fashioned style, which makes it somehow worse. Which, of course, reaches its peak for chapter one, when Suichi's dad is found dead inside of a tub after making himself into a spiral. And let me tell you, we are off to one hell of a start. This is just a complete banger of a hook. Oh my God. But now chapter two is gonna start off slow and it's gonna lull us back into that comfort that it had us in at the beginning of chapter one, right? Fuck no. We start this chapter right off with the ashes from Suichi's dad cremation forming a spiral in the sky, which drives his mom crazy. And I mean, we're like immediately at an 11. This woman starts seeing spirals everywhere, shaving her head because of her bun, because it forms a spiral, literally shearing the fingertips off of her fingers, all while getting flashes of Suichi's dad as all of this is happening. I mean, it's literally horrifying. And the second the manga shows a picture of the cochlea, the spiral inside of the inner ear, I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. Like You can see right there where it's going. You're just like, oh, I don't like that. And she doesn't see it, but you do. So you know where it's going. And it just sets the tension level like on edge, like at least mine. But what I didn't see coming was that fucking centipede. And I mean, and I mean, God damn. But of course she goes crazy and she starts seeing spirals everywhere. And whereas her husband was obsessed with and in love with them, she's terrified of them. And of course she eventually finds the spiral inside of her ear and stabs herself through the ear, which is just as awful as you think it's going to be, and eventually dies, which is awful, but it's ultimately what I expected to happen. So it's not as awful as it could be maybe. But when she stabs herself in the ear, she goes deaf, which then she loses her sense of balance and feels like she's trapped on the spiral now because she has no center of balance or sense of balance, which is not something I saw coming, which just adds a whole nother layer of hell to what this woman goes through before she ultimately dies. And then, of course, Suichi is now left completely parentless. It's... This is an explosion of ideas I wasn't ready for. Now, after all that, we do get a sense of almost normalcy again. You know, with the kids being back in school and her friend is super unhinged and weird, but the art's back to being normal almost. Yeah, back to being that more nice, cozy feel. Now back to her little friend of hers. Ever since she got this scar on her forehead, she's been able to have any boy she's ever wanted. But the boy that she really wants is Suichi. So she gets Kiri to introduce her to Suichi. Suichi immediately freaks out because of the scar on her forehead is a spiral which actually it wasn't originally but because she lives in the town it's slowly forming into a spiral and he freaks out but as the chapter goes on she's going to become more and more and more obsessed with Suichi partly because she was obsessed with him to begin with but also fueled by the fact that he doesn't want her and she's always had any boy she ever wanted and the fact that he doesn't want her just makes her want him more all the while, she's going to become more and more consumed by the spiral. And this, of course, is going to lead to some just stunning imagery and artwork. And you know this because it's just about the, it's pretty much the imagery that every YouTuber ever uses for the thumbnail of their Uzumaki video. But more importantly, this is an example of the story moving, I would say, away from the horrific and more into a quieter, a little bit maybe more nuanced story that has something to say about people and obsession in general. And the storytelling is just superb. (music) 
Now as the story moves forward, Kiri's dad's gonna become obsessed with his pottery and he won't let anyone near his kiln as he works. And now instead of making pots, he's making abstract works of art filled with a certain symbol that you'll never guess. And one night Kiri goes to the kiln and looks inside. And inside the kiln she can see that the pots are being made from the clay from Dragonfly Pond, which is also being made from the clay from the ashes from the cremated people of the town. And inside as they're being fired, she can literally see the souls of the dead from the ashes of the clay screaming in agony as they burn. And after she sees this, she's so tormented and she can't get the screaming of the, the dead out of her head to the point where she ends up calling Suichi and Suichi's going to come over and smash the kiln. And at this point, my nerves are literally on edge from this chapter. And it's not because the horrific implications of everything that's happening with the kiln and the souls and the dead, which is horrible and horrific, mind you. But why my nerves are on edge is because the person that is now infested with the obsession of spirals is Kiri's dad. And it literally just sets me on edge because so far, nobody has survived this obsession and it's already this close to home. We'll call this one Spiral Romeo and Juliet. And it ends just about as well as you think it would. And I'm still just in awe of the storytelling at this point. At first, when the chapter started, I was like, oh, yeah, pff, the Romeo and Juliet one. But by the end of it, I was more invested than I ever expected. And it hit way harder than I ever expected it would. All I can really say at this point is this is just good writing. The heroine. And the first thing I want to say about this one is Suichi's starting to look a little bit rough at this point. <laughs> but also, but also this is the first chapter where I just started to think, oh, this is a little silly. And that's not necessarily a really good feeling to have with a story that has up to this point been told so well and just so masterfully. And of course there's something to be said. And there is an underlying story of vanity and popularity and the pretty girl competition but all in all at the end of the day it just felt too silly for me to really take it that seriously and the creep factor that has been underlying the previous chapters just wasn't there for me now this one wasn't that much better either there's a boy who likes to jump out in front of people and scare them like a jack-in-the-box. And it gets him killed. And then he himself, when, when possessed by the spiral, becomes a jack-in-the-box himself. But whereas the last one felt silly and looked silly, this one feels silly because I think the story is silly. But as this one goes on, it doesn't really look silly. There's actually some really heavy-hitting imagery in here the the the, the zombie-ish corpse looking things really cool at the end but i'd say the hardest hitting for the whole chapter is the boy stuck in the wheel i mean fuck me okay now we have the snail and people are getting infected by the spiral to the point where they're literally turning into snails and I just don't care. I am now in the third chapter in a row that has not wowed me and is getting increasingly silly to the point where I'm losing my ability to care. I'm almost starting to feel fatigued by the less interesting chapters as they go on. I'm also getting the sense that this story as a whole is just going to be drawn out and too long. Now, having just said all that, we move on to the Black Lighthouse. And it's been infected with the spiral, and people are being drawn to it, and they're dying. And again, this chapter isn't super interesting, but 
when Kiri's brother gets drawn to the tower and she has to go save him so he doesn't die, suddenly I'm much more invested because now we have serious stakes that involve characters I care about and I'm actually invested in. Now Kiri's in the hospital after the events of the lighthouse. When the mosquitoes attack and re-enter Suichi, who is easily one of my favorite characters in this entire manga, so it immediately helps the story, having him back, period. My, my, my investment immediately goes up a notch whenever Suichi's around. And the women from the maternity ward wandered around with like hand drills and, and drinking people's blood. Isn't that bad? Okay, that's pretty good. But at this point, I'm really feeling that fatigue that I was talking about from the dull, boring, uninteresting chapters, silly chapters, the ones I didn't like. I really feel in that fatigue at this point. So when she busts out and sprays them with some bug spray and they all go running away from the bug spray, I'm really not impressed. I'm like, it, it's almost irritating. Okay, I want to stay now that it's at this point in the story that I am the most disconnected that I have been up to this point. I was all in at the beginning. This is something special. And I have slowly been detaching as these last few chapters have gone on. We have been on a middle of the book slump for far too long. I'm bored and I've nearly forgotten the hype that I was feeling at the beginning of the book. So we start off in the hospital and I'm just like, oh God, here we are. We're still in the hospital, oh Lord. But we're very quickly introduced to the mothers giving birth to the babies that were fed on human blood. And suddenly the cafeteria is serving mystery meat made from mushrooms. And I'm just like, whoa, never mind. hold on a second. This sounds interesting. And then we get some chicks drinking blood from blood bags. I'm like, okay, all right. And the babies are just a little bit too pretty. All right. And for the first time in a long time, my interest is actually piqued when she stumbles into a room filled with spiral mushrooms and the art's just wonderful. I mean, just th when she walked into the room, I was like, that's what I'm talking about. This is good. And it's what you expect. You know, they're the mushrooms and they're all spirals and they just look fantastic. But I also didn't realize what the mushrooms were made of just yet. And then we find out what those mushrooms actually are. And I'm just like, oh, like, oh, I, I mean, I don't know what it is about that one. I mean, with them being placentas and them growing out of the ground and the imagery of people eating them. It was just, oh, I don't know what it is about that one, but that one got me. I was thinking it was going to be some kind of cannibalism or something. And I was fine with that. Fine, you, you know, you're fine with cannibalism, but eating mushroom placentas that have grown out of the ground, I was like, ooh, I don't know. <laughs> and then the doctor says, the babe, but the baby wanted to go back to the womb, so I put him back. And I'm just like, wait a second. I know where the f*** this is going, and I don't like it. And then just to rub it in for a real quick second, we get a shot of him, like, chewing on just raw placenta. F*** this manga. And then we get the big reveal of the dead mother with the baby sewn back up inside her and she's come back to life to feed. If I was lulled into complacency by the middle of this book, book, you have my attention. This chapter is like a kick in the teeth and it knocked my teeth clear down my fucking throat. This for me was easily the hardest hitting chapter out of the entire book, period. And I don't know if that's because I was partially checked out at this point from the mid-book mid slump or what. And I know that it's subjective as to what who, what's going to hit certain people and what affects people more than the other. Like, maybe some people were upset by the snail people. You never know. But for me, f*** this chapter. We start this chapter on the beach and Suichi's back and he's looking better than ever. When a hurricane comes and hits the town, but when it hits, it hovers and it stays for a little bit. 
and it has a mind of its own and it's looking for Kiri in particular. Now this chapter is just fine. It's not great, it's not bad, it's nothing to write home about, but it's a little bit of a return to that episodic feel that we had from earlier. And it's an overwhelming medium quality chapter all in all. But the hurricane is a turning point in this manga. I just don't realize it yet. And now that the hurricane has passed and their house was destroyed, they have to move into a row house. One with a seemingly nice family on one side and a creepy hooded person on the other side who's been infected with spirals. And this chapter's a return to form for me. In this one, the creep factor is back. And this one not only brings the creep factor back with the creepy eye in the wall, but at the same time, I'm assuming that I was supposed to assume that the creepy eye belonged to the creepy hooded person infected with spirals, because that's exactly what I did. And I probably shouldn't have been, but I was completely surprised and caught off guard when I learned that the creepy eye was actually the super nice normal looking kid from the other side. Anyway, they all start to become infected by the spiral. Eventually, they have to flee the house, and when they flee the house, the infection eventually goes away. And this chapter was just a return to peak form. Peak creep factor, peak imagery, peak art, peak everything. Good chapter. Now, a second hurricane has gone through, and almost the entire town is leveled when a reporter comes to town to see what's happening. When she is attacked by whirlwinds. Remember those whirlwinds from earlier that I said were no big deal. Foreshadowing. And we learn that they are being created by kids and the kids are tormenting people with them because at this point any loud noise or fast movement or any major disruption to the air in general will cause a whirlwind to form because the, at this point the town is that infected with spirals. And because of this, gangs have formed and popped up all over town and are literally destroying anything and everything that's left of the town. And of course, tormenting people. Which is unfortunately right in line with how people actually act in unnaturally stressful situations. And the only thing more horrifying in a scary situation than the horror itself is the horrible things being done by normal people. And I bring this up now because this is where it really starts. But oh my God, does this only get worse from here? Anyway, the reporter is saved by Kiri and her family and they take her back to her place. Now this chapter is titled Chaos, and it truly embodies that. With the gangs at large, terrorizing everyone and everything in their path, the row houses are overpopulated, overstuffed. There's too many people, not enough shelter, no food. We actually find a map which foreshadows exactly where this is going and exactly where this all came from, all at the same time. And the townspeople resort to eating the snail people just to stay alive. But most importantly for me, this is where the story starts to speed up, both narratively and literally. Like, you feel like you have to start turning the pages faster, like it's starting to get out of control, like you're stuck on a downward spiral, and you yourself and the story in general is spiraling completely out of control. And I cannot overstate this feeling enough because the whole motif of this is spirals. And I assume and imagine that this was 100% intentional and on purpose, but that feeling of spiraling as you get to this point in the story is so overwhelming, it cannot be overstated. Whirlpool opens up in Dragonfly Pond. The gangs grow further out of control. More and more people are turning into snails. The people sandwiched into the row houses are literally starting to form, twist, and grow together. And our group, 
hits an all-time low when they finally lower themselves to eating snail for the first time ever. Just to reach their breaking point when Kiri's brother starts to turn into a snail himself. Now they're going to try and escape. And as they try to leave, there's going to be another group traveling alongside them. And they're bringing snail people that are just starting to turn like their supplies. Like once they fully turn into snail, well, then they just have dinner. And now the horror that people do that I brought up earlier is going to really start to spiral out of control here. And at the same time, the tension is completely maxed out because traveling alongside them are the snail eaters. And all the while, you know, her brother is currently turning into a snail and these people look crazy as fuck. And it really reaches its fever pitch when the snail people that they brought along turn into snails and they literally eat him alive. And they break away and get just far enough away, safely far enough away that they can right as her brother fully transforms into a snail that they can let him crawl away to safety without being eaten by these other guys. And it's absolutely heartbreaking. And I don't know what kind of a deus ex machina I expected to happen or just walk into the story. Maybe they would escape. Maybe once they escaped the spiral, then his transformation into a snail would start to revert back kind of like when they were infected with the spirals on their bodies once they got out of the row house they all went away but in my mind at this point somehow i'm still subconsciously holding out hope for the boy to make it through and he doesn't and when he doesn't i was crushed at this point the story feels hopeless and it's at this point in the story that I realize that this utter feeling of hopelessness that I'm feeling is all built off of the snail chapter. One that as I was reading it, I thought was completely and utterly laughable and silly. I didn't take it seriously. I didn't like it a bit. I even made a point to make fun of it in this video on purpose because now here i am at this point in the story having my lowest moment of the entire manga lowest meaning the most probably depressed feeling that i felt in the whole read through and it's all built off the back of that silly little snail chapter doesn't feel very silly anymore Anyway, having lost her brother and returned to the village, feeling completely hopeless, we find that the row houses have been built, and as they built them up, they all connected into one gigantic spiral, which of course matches the old map. And we're going to slowly make our way through this labyrinth of a spiral back to the center of town to Dragonfly Pond in search of Kiri's parents witnessing what has become of the town and the people there as we go. And the images that are on display here are scary and horrific, just like before. But now the horror of this manga has shifted entirely from the actual scary, horrible images that you see, and it has shifted to something more existential. You're getting the combination of the horrible images, but I also still feel hopeless. And I've completely and utterly lost sight of the happy ending. Like, I don't even know at this point what that would even look like. Right? Like before, you know, you have these ideas and images of, well, if you just got away, then things would revert back to normal. You could find a place that's normal. Or you could do this. Or you could do that. And in another story, you would get to the you know, center of the spiral, and you would find some magical key that's going to unlock the world and release the spell, you know. But at this point, I am so literally desperately hopeless by what this story has done to me that I can no longer see 
in my mind's eye what that might look like. At the center of the pond, now drained and empty, with only a staircase in the center, leading down. And as we travel down, Suichi falls and leaves Kiri alone. And then, as she climbs down, she enters the vast cavern of spirals. And I'm going to bring up the art again at this point, because this has just been a trip. And this feels so awe-inspiring to look at. I mean, literally awe-inspiring causing some of the most conflicting feelings. When you combine the awe that you get from these images with the hopelessness that you brought into this cave with you, and then combine that with the sadness that you feel when you see her parents consumed by the spiral. But then for it to all end with her to lay down in an embrace with Suichi embracing him and the spiral even maybe even embracing hopelessness trapped in time frozen forever seemingly i mean don't ask me to interpret this but i'm left utterly in awe of this entire story and and what it effectively does as it goes and as it goes it really does work its way inside you and as much as I want to say that it was too long and the middle was nothing but a bunch of silly chapters that weren't really any good. And if you just cut them down and cut them out and got rid of them and trimmed the story down and tightened it up and trimmed the fat, so to speak, the story would have been all the better for it. You know, just make the story shorter and tighter in general. But then I wonder, in the end, would the effect have been the same? Would it have had enough time? to kind of burrow inside of you the way it does? Or would that have been lost? Was the length necessary? In the end, I really don't know. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's rate this. In the beginning, starting off like a banger, I thought, man, this is going to be easy. Easy. This one's going to be an eight or a nine. Then I get to the middle. I thought, God, this is maybe a seven tops. I'm talking the whole thing. Maybe a seven if it's lucky. And then I finished it. And by the time I was done, I was so invested and so infected by the ideas and the story itself. I don't know. If I were to objectively rate this as a book, it might not come out as high as what I'm about to give it. But I decided not, as the more I thought about it, and the more I kid couldn't get it out of my head, I decided not to rate it as a book and as a story. I'm going to rate this as an experience. And to be quite honest, as an experience, I'm going to give this a 9.5. Anyway, as always, everybody, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.